Hello, friends. Hi, Amanda. How's it going? Hi, Lynn. Good. How are you? We're doing great. We are so excited to be here today with all of you. Yeah, welcome to the Los Angeles Public Library's Your Author Program featuring author Candice Elo. We want to thank the Library Foundation of Los Angeles and the Lenore S. and Bernard A. Fund for their generous support. I'm Amanda Charles, a librarian for young adults at Central Library's Teenscape Department. And I'm Lynn Nguyen. I'm the Young Adult Librarian at Chinatown Branch Library. It is our pleasure to host the Your Author Series today, and we hope that you enjoy this program. Please feel free to use the chat box to communicate your thoughts, comments, and questions at any time. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you all to Candice Elo. Candice Elo is a Young People's Literature finalist for the 2020 National Book Award. Uh, first generation Nigerian American writer, performer, and youth educator. She has performed her work around the country. She's a graduate of Howard University and holds an MFA in writing from Lesley University. Her work has earned fellowships from Lambda Literary and Vana, among many others. Everybody Looking is her first novel. Yay! Yay. Welcome, Candace. So, Candace, I'd like to start off with our very first question. When was the pivotal moment in your life when you realized that you were destined to be a writer? Um, I, I think that I had many, many pivotal moments that inched me toward it. And I think it was back in 2013, I realized that I had an opportunity to move to New York City. Um, just life was shifting. And that is when I started to lean toward applying to jobs that would give me time to write and time to submit to things and time to go to residencies. And so what was that? 2000? I, I don't, I don't remember what age I was. Um, <laughs> um, but in, yeah, around 2013, when I moved from DC to New York, I kind of put myself in a position where I kind of like had to give myself a shot. Thank you. And, um, so, uh, everybody looking is a beautiful novel in verse about the protagonist, Ada. Um, and uh, she, like you, attends Howard University, the prestigious historically black university that is also the alma mater of our vice president-elect. Would you please tell our teen viewers a little bit about attending Howard and how it influenced your writing? Yeah, um, I think it's actually really interesting that everybody says that Ada goes to Howard University because I never named the school. Uh, <laughs> Oh my it's, God. It is, it's, it's, I actually, I love it though, because that means I did a good job. That means everybody's like, oh, it has to be Howard. Like, duh. Um, <laughs> but my experience going to Howard University was really transformative. Um, and it wasn't because it was college. It was because I was away. I was away from my family. I was away from everything that I knew when I was being raised as a child in the Midwest. And yeah, it was the very first time that I truly, truly, truly felt like an adult that was responsible for my own decisions. And so Howard was the one of the best decisions I've ever made in my entire life, honestly, um, because I was exposed to all kinds of Black people who um, were like the Black, the smart Black kid in the class, but from all over the world. And so I felt like I was amongst a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of like family. It felt like I was surrounded by people who could see me, they understood me, they understood where I came from. Um, there were, you know, there were lots of differences obviously, but um, being at Howard was so special because of the fact that I met all these people who like now in the world are like making huge changes, making huge shifts, um, you know, creating things that didn't used to be there. Um, and just being like really a part of cultural commentary and the arts world. And so like all these people that I looked up to and admire in the media, a lot of them I went to school with or that, um, or I went to school like at the same place with. Well, we are certain that you yourself are, you know, are someone that others look up to as well. Oh. So uh, without that, um, you know, you wouldn't be here today to share your story. And we were wondering if you can just tell us a little bit about everybody looking and perhaps read a passage from your book. Yeah. Um, 
So Everybody Looking is a novel in verse that is written um, in a nonlinear format, meaning that I do not go beginning, middle to end in a traditional way. Um, it's set in a whole bunch of different time periods of the main character, Ada, um, where she you see her as at age six, seven, um, 11, 17, and 18. And basically she is a first generation Nigerian American teen who uh, is headed off to college and she's super religious. She's coming from a very religious background in which she's told that when she goes off to college, she's going to influence the world. She's gonna change everybody else and no one's going to influence her. And immediately upon arriving to campus, just the way that life is, um, she starts to meet all of these people that trigger things in her and kind of transport her back to her childhood when different things happen to kind of shape her personality. And so the the original intent of going to college was to go to change the world and you know get a job like dad and all of that stuff. And then the the goal shifts to like finding something that allows her to connect back to who she was before the world told her who she was. And that happened to be dance. Amazing. Well, we would love to hear a little bit more about Ada and uh, hear you know, where she is. So what, uh, what passage will you be reading for us and at what age group will we, will we be meeting her? So I decided that I'm going to read from the very beginning of the book. Um, I usually read from somewhere in the middle or so because I've got some favorite scenes. But um, I thought it would be really cool to read from the beginning because it really sets you um, into the scene of her like prepping her mind for, for uh, leaving home, leaving high school, like getting away from her family. So I'm going to read from that and some things that you should know um, are that, well, some things that you should just know are that this is a time that you're getting really introduced to her for the very first time. And there are a number of characters involved, but you're mainly hearing from her perspective. <clears throat> and the section is uh, high school. Graduation day. Just look at me. They got me out here wearing a dress, heels, makeup. Hope mama's proud. She sure does look like it. Looking at me and squealing like proud mamas do when their baby looks something like she came from them. Her squeals bounce from every wall of this hotel lobby. Her screams shake from her fragile body exploding like she's shocked by her own joy. Unsteady heels click against the tile toward the person she can say was the best thing she ever did with her life. Here's the scene. I'm 17 and graduating from high school and this weekend I learned to juggle. My father and his new wife are on their way to the home of the Chicago doves decked out like they're about to glide down the church's red carpet. Him in his crispiest suit, her bulging from a flowered dress, my baby brother dressed as dad's mini identical twin belted in the back seat of my father's golden Toyota Camry, is giddy knowing nothing about what day it is or how his big sister will survive it. After picking up her own mommy, keeping her seated somewhere, she can fidget far from his side of the family. Mama fidgets in my passenger seat more on edge than me, Maybe because it's been like five years since we've seen each other, but she is here. Scoffs under her breath thinking, just like her, this hoopty is proof of, proof of yet another thing I don't need. Shrugs away small thoughts not knowing dad demanded I save and buy my first Camry myself. Sits and tugs at her lopsided wig, pulls down the mirror, reapplies blood red lipstick, smudges some on her cheeks with her fingers, and I thank God knowing without this, I may not recognize her. We pull into my high school's parking lot for the last time I will ever have to smile at these people like I ever belonged here. For the 10 minutes it takes mama and me to get to the stands along the football field, a place she has never seen. I imagine the sounds of our heels to be like a song we are for once dancing together. 
Today, I am not angry at her slurred speech. I am not angry at her missing teeth. I am not angry at her fuss. I'm not angry that she looks nothing like the last time I saw her or that I don't know when the next time will be. For the 10 minutes it takes mama and me to get to the stands along the football field, I'm just happy we're both here, alive. My name is Ada, but not really. It's what my father's side calls me because I was born first. And on this day, I'm only three months away from leaving this place behind. They tell me there's a big world out there and they tell me there's so much I can do. And I know nothing but this city, but my father, but these schools where I've always been one of few specks of dingy brown and a sea of perfect white. But I know the Bible and I know how to do the right thing. So how hard could college really be? How hard could it be to one, find a dress that both mama and dad would like, two, Make sure the dress was loose enough to hide all my heavy. Three, put on heels I could stand for more than three hours. Four, pick mama up in my own car. Five, get mama to my soon to be old school. Six, sit mama somewhere I could see her. Seven, run back and forth between mama and dad. Eight, smile for every camera. Nine, smile with mama. Ten, Smile when mama insists that she be the first after it's over to have dinner with me. Dad smiles for his final picture with me, loosening the awkward grip tightly held on the outside of my right arm, his sharp signature cologne left to linger across my shoulders, a scent just as strong as the bass in the shifting tone of his voice. Proud of you, kid. You did good, he says as if I'd done my entire high school bid just now, all in one day. Thanks, Dad, I smile back, bashful warm under the way he looks at me on the days I do right. Standing back, I look at the softness peeking through thick folds of my father's face, watch yet another attempt to pull his belted suit pants over at the bottom of his round belly. Now at the end of a long day under the football field sun with beads of sweat faithfully dabbed across his widow's peak by an old white cloth always tucked in his back pocket, basking in the praise of his job well done. After the pictures are done, caught back and forth on opposite sides of the crowded field, buzzing with families proud of children they don't really know, we pull into the driveway as the sky surrounding dad's house is deepening toward black from gray. Mama glances toward his front door and back toward the road behind us, scared. I think to place a hand on her trembling shoulder, but settle for telling her it's okay, mom. Tell her, we'll be a minute. Tell her, I just need to change. Tell her, they're not home yet, but dad's house is my house too. Mama looks back at me wanting too much to see where I live, but too proud to admit she needs my permission. Stares into the side of my face, hungry for any scrap I might drop for her to catch. Reaches for my hand as I lift it just in time from the gear stick for her to miss. Shifting my foot from the brake pedal, checking my phone for the time. I tell Mama we've got 30 minutes before my father and that woman come home. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we are going to take some questions from the audience now. So if you are watching and you have any questions, please feel free to add them to the comments. Um, I, I have a question that, that is not on our list, but I was wondering, just listening to you read, which is beautiful. Do you read the Yeah, audiobook? I'm the narrator for my book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I um, I. I told them like very early in the process that I wanted to do the audio book because I have a performance um, or a background in performance poetry and I just could not imagine anybody else doing it for this book. Now that I've heard you read, I can't either. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Thank you. So it looks like we already have a question from um, the audience. Uh, many people saying thank you for the reading. Um, we have, it looks like a young audience member, um, Brielle, who is 17, wants to know um, some guidance on becoming a published author while also going to college. Mm. 
Wow. Uh, I mean, I guess off the top of my head, I would immediately say to not be afraid to live, I guess, like an unconventional life. So, you know, like a lot of us were raised to go in a specific order as far as like your future and success. Like, you know, go to college, then get a job, then maybe like the job, then maybe build something of your own, blah, blah, blah. And I think what helped me a lot was I realized like as a student that I had to take on the kind of jobs that would give me enough time to write. I had to take on jobs that were flexible and that would allow me to control my schedule um, because my biggest issue or challenge as a writer is having time. Like for the rest of my life, I'm pretty sure the world is going to always make me feel like everything else is more important than what I have to do. That like everything else is work and that writing is like a, a game or it's play or it's just a hobby. Um, and it, writing requires me to schedule just like everything else. It requires me to block the world out just like a lot of jobs. And it also requires me to have a certain kind of environment and, and level of focus. And so um, early on in college, I just started to think about, like I started to play with um, the idea that I control a whole bunch of aspects of my life. Like I can control how my bedroom feels and looks I can control my schedule. Like when you go to college, you can really, like if you're not a morning person, you can schedule all your classes at night. Like it's, it's, it's mind blowing when you start to realize like, hey, I am responsible. So if I need this thing in order for me to be creative and to make the thing that I have in my head, well then that's just what it's gonna have to be. And if it doesn't look like everybody else's schedule and it looks weird, great because a lot of people don't take the path that is necessary to like become that person that they are like feeling themselves be inside. That's great. I hope that answers your question. And that's a great answer. Um, we have, I have a question here about the book and about what you just read. When you wrote this book, who was this book intended for? And how closely do you relate to Ada? <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Um, when I first started writing the book, I was writing it entirely for myself, 100%. It was just the book that I always knew I wanted to write, or or rather the story I wanted to tell. Um, growing up, like I, I can't remember a single book that reflected where I'm from and and not like, oh, I haven't, I hadn't heard of a book with like a, you know, a Nigerian protagonist. I hadn't heard of a book or read a book where the protagonist is a teenager and one of her parents is American, the other parent is West African, and she's caught in the middle of it and having to like balance both worlds. And so I wrote this book for first for me, and then it expanded to writing it for all the other first gen kids because it's a very unique experience. It's not like being born in another country. It's not like being just born here and your whole family is from here. It's very nuanced. Um, and so I wrote for the first gen kids. I wrote for um, the baby queers. So like you don't, you've never actually thought about your sexuality. Um, you possibly feel like you feel different than um, your friends. Uh, you feel like you're having feelings that you can't share with your family because of the way that your family um, is culturally. Um, so I wrote it for the kid that just has something that's going on inside of them that like has never been allowed um, out loud and who really needs an opportunity to explore um, how they really feel about life and how they really feel about themselves. That's awesome, thank you. And so it looks like we have another question from the audience. Um, so Lauren Spector um, says, uh, your novel feels so personal. Is any of Ada's story biographical? Did you have a dance studio and teacher like she did in college? Mm -hmm. um, and also she comments that, um, I love those scenes in the studio. Yeah, uh, thank you for saying that. Um, the scenes in the studio were actually the hardest to write. 
I've been a dancer since I was four years old and I had never had to write about what it feels like to actually do it. So those are really difficult. And thank you, you just made me feel like, you know, all that hard work was valid. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the so everybody looking is semi-autobiographical. Um, I leave it up to the reader to figure out, you know, what they think is real or what is true. Um, I did put a lot of myself into the story. I don't know how to write fiction that is not autobiographical, to be honest with you. And a lot of the writers that I read, like it's obvious to me that they've put a lot of themselves into the work. It's fiction, of course, because you know we're working off of inspiration and you know we're keeping some privacy. But um, yeah, this book was written because the story is very personal. It had to be the first story that I told as an author. Um, and I put a lot of fa family, like a lot of my um, personal family dynamics are very similar to the main characters. Um, and then also as a high school teacher, I got really close to a lot of my students and they inspired a lot of the scenes. Um, so. I was writing this while I was teaching high school, which helped me so much. It felt like the dialogue just spilled out because I just I'm I'm constantly surrounded surrounded by um, teens that are the same age as the ones that are in the book. So it was just like, this is great. This is awesome. Um, it was it, yeah. So a lot of the a lot of the material in there is very close to home, um, but I leave it up to the reader to have their own experience with that. That makes like that makes it make so much sense um, that you are also a dancer and that you are working with teens because I feel like two things that this book does so amazingly well are capture that feeling of being a teen. I mean, like you know, even for those of us who are very far away from being teens, um, it comes back. It just brings that back. And the other thing that I really love about it is the way that it conveys movement. Like the writing just has movement. Even the cover, which is gorgeous by the way, has movement to it. I mean, there's just movement throughout this book. And I never read a book that conveyed that sense of movement as, mm. as viscerally uh, mm. as this does. Thank you. I um, One thing that I did do um, throughout the writing process of the dance scenes, I was living in New York at the time, like I mentioned, and um, I oftentimes would write right after I took a class that helped me a lot. So there was like, there are tons of notes in my phone um, where I'm writing down the actual uh, tactile feeling of either coming out of class super sweaty, coming out of class feeling like I just got dragged by the teacher and I should never dance again. Um, and coming out of class and feeling like I got it, like something clicked in my head. And that's what I wanted the reader to experience because I feel like there's nothing like any creative person, any artist knows that it, there is very few things that's co comparable to when you actually like click into place the way that you want to, whether you finish a painting or you, you get a step um, or you, you finish a book, like it's, it's, it's euphoric. And so that makes me really happy. I feel like I accomplished something really big. Thank you. <laughs> Would you be able to share what your writing process was like for this story or for this book? Um, you know, how did you pull all of these characters together and um, how do you organize your thoughts in a way so that way it, uh, it, it you know, pulls together for, for our, all of our readers to understand? Um, I would not recommend my writing process to anyone. Uh. <laughs> It only works, I feel like, for me, and it only started working probably the past two years. And I've been a professional writer, I guess, for 11 years. Um, and I feel like the pandemic is very responsible for me um, finally getting it together and saying, this is how I'm going to do it. Um, so I write between, when I'm when I'm working toward a deadline, I write between anywhere between three to six days a week. Um, if I'm very close to the deadline, I clear my schedule entirely and I get up and I go straight to my desk and I stay there until I'm done for the day. 
um, which is, again, would not recommend. My hips hurt. Uh, <laughs> my hips hurt, I need a heating pad, all kinds of things start happening. Like my friends get all of the strange text messages and phone calls really late at night when I'm really close, that just happened where I text a friend and was like, I need to be on FaceTime for the next two hours so I don't go to sleep. You down? Cool, all right. Um, but my process in general, I guess, would be from, I guess, well, for this particular book, I started with all the autobiographical material. And so what I did was uh, Jason Reynolds, um, he, back then he knew, he was one of few people who knew I wanted to write a novel in verse. And he started teaching at Leslie and told me to apply for the program. And I didn't wanna go to an MFA program really, unless it was a program that just let me write my own thing. And luckily I went, we, you know, I went to Leslie. Leslie is a, um, at Leslie's MFA program, it was low residency. So that meant I didn't have to stop my life to do the program. And so he told me, write the first 15 pages and don't think about them. Just write the first 15 pages that come to your head. And so I did that. I barely edited <laughs> and I submitted my application with the first 15 pages and I got in with that. And so I used the two years that I was at Leslie to write the first draft. And yeah, the process was the first two years just drafting. Basically, I put myself in a position where I'm being assigned um, 30 pages of work per month, um, which is very little in comparison to what I do now. And uh, yeah, I get feedback constantly. Twice a year, I do workshopping on it. Um, and then recently, I left like regular jobs. Like earlier in the year, I worked my last part-time job in New York City. And my routine became do all the hard stuff early in the day. So like get up really early. And before we had quarantine, I would just get up and go straight to the, to the cafe around the corner, stay there until I hit at least 2000 words, two to 4,000 was the goal. Um, so whenever I write, that's my goal is between two to 4,000 words. Um, and the, yeah, so I don't have anything, any real structure, but to like just go full steam ahead as fast as I can um, and to prioritize the writing, do that before you do all the other stuff because once the world starts, you can't really stop it. Um, yeah, and yeah, I think that like, I'm, I'm really weird about giving advice about the writing process because I really think it it depends on what your life is. So um, you mentioned Jason Reynolds, who I feel like Jason Reynolds is a, a theme or a recurring character in our author interviews. Earlier in your author program, we interviewed Daniel Clayton, who also mentioned um, how encouraging Jason mm -hmm. Reynolds has been. Um, and you also thank Jason Reynolds and Jacqueline Woodson in the acknowledgments of everybody yeah. looking. Can you talk about the authors who have inspired and mentored you, who they are, and how did you make the connection, and how have they influenced your work? Mm -hmm. Um, so Jacqueline Woodson inspired me from afar, uh, starting with Jason recommending I read, uh, Brown Girl Dreaming, because he knew I wanted to do a novel in verse, and he was just like, this, this is, read this, this is an example of how you can do it. I read it, um, and then I was, a, then he showed me the early version of Long Way Down, I read both, and then I, I had a good picture of what these novel and verses looked like. Um, so I, Jacqueline Woodson, I started reading a lot of her stuff, like once I read Brown Girl Dreaming. Um, then earlier on when I had first met Jason, I read everything he had online before he had any books out. Um, then I, you know, we became friends and he just, I just started to, read a lot of his work um, to learn how to tell a story because my background is in poetry. And so I know how to, I know how to really hone in on a moment, but I am still learning how to tell a long form story. And so I studied his work, I studied Jacqueline Woodson's work. And then at Leslie, I studied with Tracy Baptiste. Um, and she mentored me a lot about making characters feel real. 
And so I got a early taste of or a look into what you have to do as an author to start thinking from the frame of mind of your characters. And I'm, you know, I, I didn't realize until late in the process that I was showing a character at so many different ages of her life. Like it just did not occur to me what I was doing. Um, and it was Tracy that was just like, you know, you're you're showing I die at age six, you should sound like you're six. <laughs> you should sound like you're six. You shouldn't sound like, you know, your internal dialogue as a grown up thinking about yourself as a child. Um, so Jacqueline, Jason, Tracy, um, just like as an academic advisor. Um, and then I was mentored a lot by the open mic poetry community in Washington, DC. Um, I used to attend an open mic called Spit That. And I went there, it's a legendary open mic. Like if you ever lived in DC and you're a poet or a writer, you probably have been there and you're black, black or brown, you probably have been there. Um, and I was, I feel like that whole community raised me. Like they gave me an opportunity to read my poems when they were, they were a little cringeworthy, like a little, I don't know, a little raw. I wasn't editing my poems back then. So, <laughs> um, and so I really needed to be nurtured and taught by an open mic poetry community where they give you feedback. And I have an opportunity to just come back week after week and you know, be like, this is my new version. I heard what you guys said last week, or I noticed you really like this, or I was thinking about this. Um, so yeah, those were those were the main people that really like set things off for me. Wow. The novel definitely defies, uh, I mean, captures the insecurities and self-doubt of blame um, of uh, adolescents in a way that many adults would probably like to forget, what other truths do you believe other adults uh, often fail to acknowledge about being a teen? And how do you represent mm. those truths in your work? I mean, I was raised to believe that, or I guess I was raised within many traditions that basically like what I was observing communicated to me that um, that I didn't, as a child, I didn't really like, I couldn't be right, like, or I couldn't be respected. Like it's, in, like it's impossible to disrespect a child or it's impossible for a child to be an expert of a certain experience. Um, I really wanted to show in the book that this child, this teenager knows exactly what's going on in her life. And no one could really, no one could really um, illustrate or express what it's like to be in that position, but her. And so I really, my hope is that when adults read this, they realize there's a lot going on in a child's head or a teenager's head. And you get nowhere by assuming what is in their head. You get all the places by realizing that you don't know anything. Like you, you only know what you're seeing and what you're observing. And of course, parents and adults um, can see a lot of things that kids can't see, but there is a big piece of, of who a person is that you need to hear from your child or you need to hear from a young person directly. You cannot assume it. You can't just tell them that that's what they are. Um, you have to observe and you have to ask and create a space where they're not penalized for what they say when you ask those questions. That's, that's really important. Um, and I, you know, there are some really visceral moments in the book um, with the diary. I just love how you um, make the case for, like there's the, the initial um, instance with the diary, but then there's like, the importance of it again and again, like going on through, like as you see more of her life, you know, through the book. Um, you also have this really great uh, uh, line early on um, when, uh, during the graduation scene about the parents um, taking pictures with, with children that they don't really know, mm -hmm. um, which I think was really powerful. Uh, so I don't really know if I have a question. I think maybe I might just be complimenting you. But <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, I, I do think that like, that's 
such an excellent point about um, making space for children and, and acknowledging that they are experts. Um, let's see where this go. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so uh, a lot of writers for fiction uh, for young adults, they, um, and I think you, you probably got into this a little bit earlier, but I'm going to ask anyway. Um, they say that they write the books they wanted to read when they were teens. Um, so what are some things that you wanted from books that you didn't get as a teen and how does that inform what you write now? Hmm. I really, and this hasn't changed about me at all. Um, I really like to see teenagers, um, see, see the vulgarity and the raciness and the hedonism of being a teenager on the page. Um, still to this day, there's a lot of adults that think like YA is like easy to write and foofy foofy and not hard hitting and really like, you know, just like nice and everything is about like a teachable moment or something like that. And it's like, no, like YA is, is, can be just as drama filled and hard hitting and heavy and searing as adult fiction. The difference is the protagonist is a teenager and it's surrounded, it's centered on a young person's life. And so I really, I wanted to read the books that I wasn't supposed to read, quote unquote. Like I, you know, I wanted to read the, the books where they're talking about sex and they're talking about, um, you know, kids getting into like drinking too early or like some of those like hard discussions they might have in their home when their parents are divorcing or like going through relationships and you know, your, your parents and your family not even knowing what you're dealing with. I wanted to see all that stuff because it just wasn't really talked about openly in my own home. Um, like a lot of kids, I was just taught like, I wasn't old enough to hear about certain things or I wasn't, old, you know, I wasn't ready for certain conversations. And I think personally, it may be wrong for some teens, but like, that's a lot, that's what a lot of the anger that I had stemmed from is just like people not, you know, adults in my life, not telling me the truth and not exposing me to things that I needed to know. And you know, being in college and the first time I'm hearing about certain things or talking about certain things is amongst my peers and not not from an adult who might be able to like, you know, just give me some type of warning before it happens, right? And so I think, yeah, I think like I, I really, I'm really excited for teenagers who are growing up in 2020 because there's so many good books that if I were young, if I were a teenager, you know, I, as an adult, I'm doing it now, but as a teenager, I would choose them without an adult bringing it to, my, you know, bringing it to me. Like, it's just all the drama, all the juiciness, all of the real stuff that I wanted to read is happening now. Yeah. Would you be able to uh, share with us if um, you're working on another project? you know, something closely related to your message that you want all of our readers to know? Yeah, I am really, I'm, I'm really secretive about books that when the manuscript isn't done, but uh, I am working on a second novel in verse uh, as my, yeah, my second book. And the main character is very different from this one. I wanted, I told my agent, I wanted to have fun and I wanted to write a book for the kids who are uh, like a lot of the kids I taught who are just so smart and beyond what adults even know and who are already over the shenanigans of this world. They're already like, you know, when I grow up, I am not even messing with that. I'm not even dealing with that. Like me and my friends, we're gonna like go move over here. We're all gonna get a house together. We're gonna live on the same street, forget marriage, forget da da da. Like I wanna write, I, I am writing a book for those kids who are who are imagining a different world than the ones that their parents grew up in. That's awesome! I can't wait. Um, so, Me neither. <laughs> one of our <laughs> uh, one of our questions about everybody looking um, is that it illustrates the importance of queer relationships, um, not just romantic relationships, but also friendships as sources of support and personal growth. 
can you talk about the role that Adah's friendship with Kendra plays in her self-realization? And mm -hmm. um, any advice for how young people in the audience today can form and maintain friendships that support, acknowledge, and nurture their authentic self? Oh my God. Wow. You're asking me the thing I'm still learning as an adult. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's one of my favorite parts of the book. And it's uh, Kendra is a character that was written in very late in the process. Like she didn't exist in the first versions at all. Um, and then, you know, at some point in the process, it became apparent to me that I needed to um, include her in that part of the story to create this, create some certain tensions that I wanted to happen. Um, and yeah, so Kendra is there to kind of emphasize the fact that a lot of us learn about life through relationships. And that is what Ada is doing the entire story. She is learning and shaping her worldview based on the experiences she has with people who are close to her. And so this friendship is so unique and special because she's never met anybody like her before. And there's an immediate admiration for her confidence and the way and the fact that Kendra is a rule breaker. She makes she makes the world and life work for her. Um, and she's, you know, she's young like Ada is. She's a little bit older, but she's still a young person. And it's the first time that Ada is experiencing someone so self-actualized and someone who is like designing the life that they want. Whereas Ada up until that point had just been walking into like the footsteps of other people that came before her. And she's, yeah, she's meeting someone who's like, um. I could just, you know, I could just piecemeal my things that I need together and this is the life I'm going to have. Um, so I, yeah, I think that to your second part of the question, um, advice that I would give is that like I hang out with the kids that um, are into the same things that you're into. Um, you know, gravitate towards the people who are welcoming of you and who want um, you to be around, it's really not worth it to try to pursue friendships with people who are just like, who are just popular, right? You don't know, you don't know if you have anything in common with them or if they're going to bring anything good out of you. Um, and so I just, I say, go towards the people who like you, you, you want to do the same things. Like I started to shift as a young person getting into the art scene. Like I just started to hang out with people who like to write who people who people who like to dance, people who are going to the same school as me, um, people who are also West African, like meeting people who had the same background as me. And so making sure you just look for your own people, your own, like your own people. And also um, something I'm I'm just now learning as an adult is is to give people a chance to like show up for you. So like when we're teenagers, when we're young, we don't trust anybody. And that is that is a valid feeling, right? Like, because a lot of teenagers are, you know, shady because they're still learning life. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like early on in your life, I think it, it just, you know, give people a chance to really be your friend. You'd be surprised where you find friends. Wow. Well, you know, I know we're heading towards the uh, end of our program, but I wanted to ask you one thing since we're talking about teen life and everything. Um, if you could turn back time, what is the one thing that you wish you could tell your young self? And what advice do you have for anyone that's interested in becoming a writer like yourself? <laughs> um, hmm. Advice that I would give to my teenage self I would probably tell my teenage self to splash around a little bit more. So like, I was very careful, very calculated, very afraid to be disobedient um, or push against the opinions of adults when I was younger. Um, and I don't, you know, I'm not condoning necessarily, you know, just being super disruptive with authority, but I do suggest that you, when you're young, like you, you have some room to make some mistakes. It's really how a lot of us learn. Um, so I would just say like splash around, try things that you're interested in, explore, 
Um, even if something seems weird, that might be the thing that like really just like sets you off in life. And so I, I would say I'd, I'd tell myself to splash around a little bit. Um, and advice to young writers, I feel like um, I say it so much on all these events, but it's to try. Um, the only way to discover if you have something is to just write it down and see it on a page. It's the only way. If you never start the story idea and you develop it entirely in your head and you never type a word, the book doesn't exist. So you just have to try. That is excellent advice. Um, so I think we may have time for one more question. It looks like we are uh, out of audience questions, but we do have a couple of comments. Um, again, more thanks uh, for sharing your writing process. And also, um, Lauren hopes that um, your new project means that you will be writing much more YA in the future. Um, and so I think we can fit one more question in. Um, you talked about, actually, this is one I really wanted to ask you, because you talked about the pandemic helping you crystallize your writing process, mm -hmm. which we talked to a lot of authors and they talked about how to get over the pandemic. They talked about how to still be productive during the pandemic, but nobody has said the pandemic really put it all in place for me. Mm -hmm. And so um, I wanted to ask, how are you, uh, how, how has the pandemic changed things for you? How are you de-stressing? How are you caring for yourself and managing? Like, like what has, has changed and how are you um, thriving? Um, I, so before the pandemic, I still had a part-time job and COVID-19 arriving, uh, accelerated my decision to quit that job. Um, I was going to work, I was probably going to work into June, maybe July with that job. And I abruptly quit the job and decided that I just needed to stay put in Philadelphia and do my work. And so fun fact, the first three to four months of the pandemic, I didn't write anything. Um, I could not. I, I The way that I respond to stress is not like a lot of people. Some people like work a lot and try to busy their minds when they're stressed. I don't do anything. I shut down completely. So um, it, yeah, the shift in the world rocked my ability to create new things for a long time. And then what happened was I just got pushed into a position where like I needed to make money. And I also was tired of not using my brain. Like I forgot that writing is something that I started to do to save myself. Like Somewhere along the way, it became my job, and I forgot that it's something that I did, I depended on in order to process my feelings. And so I had to get back to my desk in order for me to get back to my desk. Like I had to start writing something in order to write the stuff that's really, that really was due. And so the way that it changed me was it, it brought to surface the things that I need to be creative and to complete projects. It brought to surface, it, it, it reminded me all of the ways that I have been able to write even in really terrible circumstances. Um, it, yeah, it gave me a lot of space to practice my routines because I'm at home all the time. So I have, I have changed my schedule. I've changed what I'm working on. I've changed the time of day when I write so many times. I don't even know how many times it's been. But what changed was I had the space and I was. I felt like I was backed into a corner and it felt like the universe was asking me to choose how I wanted to spend my time, whether the world is ending or not. Like, how do you want to spend your time? Do you want to be like stressing about the fact that you're not writing or do you want to write and see what happens? Like. So I think my perspective shift a lot. There was a paradigm shift for me um, because I have written, I've completed manuscripts faster than I ever have during this time. Um, and it's, it's kind of mind blowing. So I just, I just learned what I was capable of. It's shifted my perspective um, and it's given me a little bit more energy now that I've, I gave myself time to like not make something. Thank you. Yeah. That that so it hasn't been an easy journey, but it 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 uh, 
has been productive overall. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Um, then do you want to do one more question or do you want to go to this or that? If we have, if we have a, I, I feel like I have a lot of questions for this or that um, because I'm adding in a, pop, a bunch of popcorn questions this time. So we're changing things up a little bit. Okay. <laughs> but let's see, if there are no more questions from our audience members, we can definitely uh, move along. Okay, I think we're I think we're good. Okay, so Candice, uh, there's two parts to this game. The first part is this or that, so you pick one or the other. And then once we start with the popcorn, I'll let you know. It's like, you know, you, you rapid fire questions that I'm gonna shoot out at you, you just answer it, okay? Okay. <laughs> All right, okay, let's get started. Okay, cats or dogs? Cats, easily, I have a cat. Coffee or tea? I really have to choose, wow. Tea. Mountains or beaches? Beaches. Instagram or Twitter? Instagram. Poems or haiku? They're both haiku, they're both poems. <laughs> or they're novels. Poems. Oh, poems or novels? Yeah. Uh, novels. Hip hop or rap? Rap is a part of hip hop. It's... <laughs> Oh, <laughs> um, do you want me? Do you want to change it? Yeah. Um. Here, I'll put hip hop or <laughs> pop music. How about that? Okay, hip hop easily. Okay. <laughs> Netflix or YouTube? Netflix. DC or New York? Wow. I really feel like I'm not. I can't answer this. Um. <laughs> It just have to be New York because I, I really, that was the last place I lived and it's the most familiar still to me. Okay. Mm uh, Jacqueline Woodson or Jason Reynolds? Really? <laughs> oh my God. This is really wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm only gonna pick Jason just because I knew him before Jacqueline Woodson and he's like family. So it, it seems kind of messed up if I wouldn't say Jason. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> All right, now it's time for our popcorn questions. Um, what is your favorite song on repeat right now? Uh, it's a SoundCloud mix. It's a whole bunch of songs. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and do you have a favorite food? A favorite type of food that you like to eat or enjoy? Pasta. Pasta, Pasta. okay. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your favorite color? Mustard yellow. Uh, <laughs> what is your all-time all favorite movie? Fight Club. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. do, you, uh, do you have a favorite holiday? My very favorite holiday is uh, New Year's Eve, and right behind that is Halloween. Okay. Uh, do you have a favorite restaurant you like to dine out at? I don't. I feel like I don't really remember restaurants that well anymore. I and I do prefer my like to cook at home. Mm. So that brings us to the next question. What is your favorite dish to cook at home? All things breakfast. Uh, and what is the fa what is your favorite place that you've traveled to? Um, wow. I'm gonna have to say Belize. I went to Belize after I graduated from my MFA program. Nice. What's one thing you're looking forward to doing after we move past this pandemic? <sighs> Traveling. I have so many people I really want to see. I, I'm ready to like travel regularly. And the last question we have here is, what are you most thankful for this year? My community. Great. Yes.
Wow. Okay. Well, yeah. that was it. That was it. That was it. Okay. <laughs> not too. Not that wasn't too too bad. I thought no. it was gonna get real intense. No. 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 Fun <laughs> <laughs> <Quite> and personal. <laughs> Yeah, it's always just real quick and fun. Um, yeah. I'm with you on cats, and I have to say, I love that mustard yellow. That is that is the best color. Um, Thank you. So, makes me so happy. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, we've so I guess we've reached the end of our time. Um, so we want to thank you, Candice Elo, so much for speaking with us today, and thank you to those of you in the audience um, who are watching. Um, we also wanted to let everyone know that our own city librarian, John Zabo, will be interviewing um, Linnell George, author of A Handful of Earth, A Handful of Sky, The World of Octavia E. Butler, on Thursday, December 3rd at 3.30. There we go. After that program at 6 p.m., you can tune in to the next winter season LA Made program with expert paper craft, crafter Sarah Neal. And the Your Author series is back on Friday, December 4th at 4 p.m. with children's author Ashlyn Ancy, and C, pardon me, um, who will talk about her latest book, Hedgehog! Exclamation Yay. point. <laughs> well, Candace, we hope you do visit us here in Los Angeles very soon. And we look forward to hopefully seeing you in person so we can welcome you here uh, yes. and see all the fun things that we have here in Los Angeles. Uh, we would like to thank everyone. Thank you. And to, to everyone that tuned in today, have a happy and safe Thanksgiving holiday. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Um, yep. Thank you. You could purchase the book. Oh, yeah. There's some links in the um, chat box right now. You could purchase the book. Everybody looking at bookshop.org. Yeah. And then if you want to uh, hit up uh, Candice, she is always on Instagram. And what is your Instagram handle for everyone to? So it's become her B E C O M H E R. There we go. Both on Twitter and Instagram. Both on Twitter and Instagram. Oh All yeah, right. it's right there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. Thank you, Neil. Yeah, <laughs>